Hello and good evening everybody. I am Christa Morgenrath of Stimmen Afrikas African Voices and I'd like to welcome you to our first reading in the new series of events called Länderfokus. Our guest tonight is the brilliant L. Nathan John with his book Becoming Nigerian, a Guide. Originally, the event should have taken place in the Cologne Rautenstrauch Joost Museum in the frame of their exhibition Resist. Due to the pandemic, this is unfortunately not possible. However, I would like to inform you that the exhibition about 500 years of anti-colonial resistance in the Global South will be opened digitally on January the 29th. We are glad and excited to present our first live stream in the theater of Die Wohngemeinschaft in Cologne and like to thank our event partners for their support. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Stiftung Umwelt und Entwicklung North Rhine-Westphalia and Engagement Global and last but not least, our wonderful volunteers. Our thanks go also to our cooperation partners of the Sonnenblumen Community Development Group in Cologne. They will hold another digital event with Elnais and John tomorrow. You will find all information about it on our webpage. It is our colleagues from the Sunflowers who recommended Yinka Kehinde to us. She will accompany our program in a parallel Zoom meeting. She's a woman of color and diversity coach and trainer. And you can approach her if you don't want to bring any comments or thoughts or questions into the open group. Just follow the Zoom on the link of the web page drin geblieben, drin geblieben, please. You can also see there the opportunity for donations, which we would be very grateful for. I'm very happy that A. Nathan came to Cologne and made this live stream possible. And I would also like to thank the moderator Abdurrahim Hassan for his participation. He's also from Nigeria and working as a journalist for Deutsche Welle. Now I want to hand over the floor to him and wish you all a very nice and exciting evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Krista and the other members and crew who are behind the cameras. And uh, as Krista said, for more on public question or discussion or something that you would like to discuss, um, Yinka Kihinde is live with you in another digital room. Hi, Yinka. Hello. Yeah. And Shoren and Yulia is also here with us at the back of stage. And here is Elnathan John. He's a well-known Nigerian novelist and as a well lawyer and one of the most famous renewed statists in Nigeria. Your essays and writings has been published in various publications such as Economics, Financial Times, Par Contra, Le Monde Diplomatique, the Africa Report, and The Guardian as well. Your short stories have been shortlisted twice for the Ken Prize for African Writing in 2013 and 2015. Your novel, Born on a Tuesday, will not be left behind. Well, we would like to know more about Elnath and John. Oh, thank you for that introduction and for all who have made this event possible. I'm pleased to be in Cologne uh, at a very uh, turbulent time uh, for events and, and, and participation like this. I, for the past few years, have been interested in the history of, of northern Nigeria and po politics, religion and culture. And so much of my research these days have been around um, looking at uh, particularly northern Nigeria in the 1800s yeah. and how uh, events that culminated in the establishment of the Sokoto Caliphate, for example, happened and what its relevance is for, for Nigeria today. So uh, that's 
some of the things that I've, I've been working on in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm also working on a novel now uh, set in contemporary Nigeria, uh, and that's my most recent project. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here talking about uh, something completely different, which is satire set in Nigeria. Yeah. This book you recently uh, wrote and published in 2019, um, A Guide to Nigeria, How to Become or How Becoming a Nigeria. How did you come about and combine all this perspective? How money yeah, dominate like much and many more aspect in Nigeria? How do you come about this idea? So I've been writing Sata for close to a decade now. Uh, and one of the reasons why I got interested in Sata is the, the form itself and, and how I'd seen people before me utilize this form to engage in social critique. So people like uh, Peter Enahoro, who is probably one of our most prominent satirists, to date. He began um, a column in, 1960, in the 1960s uh, in a newspaper called uh, Daily Times and his, one of his first columns was how to be a Nigerian and it was it became very popular and in fact it, he wrote a book eventually which was a compilation of all of his uh, satirical essays in that a newspaper called how to how to be a Nigerian, and, and that book is still is still uh, available. He he published that book in 1966, and I found that this the the form was very well suited to talk uh, talking about Nigerian uh, problems, especially uh, interrogating the effect of power on Nigerian so society, especially power as diffuse as as it is, not concentrated. At, at the, at the top alone with say the political elite but but all aspects of Nigerian society that hold or, or hold power you know whether it's the middle class whether it's the religious class whether it is people who are able even in their deprivation to say for example keep domestic workers at home mm -hmm. and it's that interrogation of power that uh, sort of led me to think about Sata as a form in in writing about uh, the Nigerian uh, situation and especially Nigerian dysfunction. Yeah, but this uh, means uh, you just wrote this book about the current situation or is just like a perspective of other people thinking? So uh, one of the, the, the first uh, parts of the book, which is uh, how to worship the Nigerian God, was a column in, in the same newspaper that Peter Nahoro had written, Daily Times. And so I was thinking, how can I um, begin to interrogate weekly, week after week, because I had a weekly column, how can I talk about a different aspect of, of Nigerian society that was topical at the time? And so when the idea for the book came, I began to look at all of the pieces I had done and new pieces that needed to, 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 to be worked into the, to, to, to the book. And, and, and see how that would create a narrative uh, uh, that would be relevant for uh, the conversation about Nigeria today. One will maybe ask, uh, maybe you have been like a, one way or the other victimized in some topics you touch in this book or how? Well, anyone who was born in Nigeria, who grew up in Nigeria or who has any business or dealings with Nigeria knows that Nigeria will affect you wherever you are, whether you are in Nigeria <laughs> or outside. You know, yeah. Ni Nigeria will always happen to you. And I, I, I have a friend who always says her prayer is, may Nigeria never happen to you. <laughs> yeah. And and of course, having spent most of my life in Nigeria, I, I'm no stranger to how Nigeria can affect you in very profound ways, both for, for, for good and, and otherwise. In which way is you have gone through? Well, I mean, I, I, have, I have gone through it all. And I mean, I do have a lot of uh, privilege in, uh, for example, the fact that I'm university educated and that I have access to, I had access to literature, I had access to 
a certain class that did not expose me to the worst of Nigeria's problems. So, so of course, that is not my particular experience. But I, of course, I had experience with Nigerian police, for example. I had Niger experience with Nigerian politicians, with Nigerian government, um, with people, peers, and otherwise that were involved, for example, in things that were less than exemplary uh, in, in their day-to-day -day life, in their social interactions. And of course, I'm, I always say as a satirist, one of the things you do is ask yourself how you are personally implicated in, in the critique. Because if you don't start from there, then you've become one of the people that you're trying to satirize. In yeah, fact. interesting. I think maybe later on we are going to see how you put things in order. But now I think Elnathan, it will be good f to have like an introduction background of this book. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I will. I will. I like to start from the beginning, and the first uh, chapter of the book is the Gospel according to Nigeria, which sort of it draws on the history of Nigeria and how Nigeria came to be, and and what I call the Nigerian question: Why are we like here? Like you mean. Pre-colonial Yes, era? from that from that time until mm. you know. So, so what is the fundamental Nigerian question? Mm. Who are we as a people, and why are we here? And and so th this sort of inter you know interrogates that in a way. Okay. And so I'll, I'll read the Gospel according to Nigeria, chapter one. In the beginning, the British created the northern and southern protectorates. Now the nation was formless and empty, and darkness covered our collective identity. And the British said, let there be Nigeria, and there was Nigeria. And the British saw that Nigeria was good for them, and they separated the ruling class from the serfs. And they said, just as we have a vault between us and you, let there be a vault to separate the rulers from the citizens. So the British created Nigeria in their own image. In the image of their colonial rulership, they created it. Oppressor and oppressed, they created them. And there was independence from the British, and there were coups and counter coups and there were military dictators. And the decades passed, and the military rulers stripped their garbs and uniforms and transformed into civilian rulers. And they declared, old things have passed away, and all things have become new. Chapter 2. For our military dictators loved the country so much that they gave their only begotten uniforms and the right to make decrees that whosoever believed in them and voted for them should be stuck with them until their old age. Chapter 3. And it came about that a usurper who was not a military dictator found his way to the throne through natural deaths and impeachments, and he came upon Nigerians like a thief in the night. And he came not to build but to steal and destroy, and he left Nigerians blind and poor. And Nigerians looked to a former dictator and said to him, Lord, we do not know where we are going. And the dictator answered them and said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to good governance except through me. And he gained followers and drove out the usurper who had left Nigerians blind and poor. And his followers said, Lord, show us the way and that will be enough for us. Show us change. And he answered them and said, do you believe that I am good governance and good governance is me? You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. And his followers worshiped him and sang his praises day and night. And when his ministers proved incompetent, his followers praised him and denounced those ministers. And when the people began to groan under much suffering, they looked on to their benevolent dictator. And he said to them, if you love me, keep my commands. Hate those who hate me and love those who love me. My enemies cannot accept me because they neither see me nor know me, but you know me, for I live with you and will be with you. And some skeptics said, but Lord, why do your ministers do silly things like wear red berets and have nothing under the berets? And the benevolent dictator replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Chapter seven, blessed are those who steal from the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of political rebirths. Blessed are those who make others like Shiites mourn, for they will be comforted by the dead and putrefying bodies. 
Blessed are those who despise the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those with good political alliances, for even when they are caught, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who hate the pure in heart, for they will see the inner walls of the presidential villa. Blessed are those who trend political hashtags, for theirs is the kingdom of bank alerts. Blessed are the kidnappers, for their ransom money will come intact and without repercussion. Blessed are those with a long career of theft and destruction, for they will be called elder statesmen. Chapter 8. The benevolent dictator gathered his disciples and taught them a new prayer. He said, you must pray then this way. Our Father, who art aliko, hallowed be thy wealth, thy monopolies come. Thy will be done in this government as it was in the previous ones. Give us this day your refinery as we give you our cheap dollars. Forgive us our suspicions as we have forgiven those who are suspicious of us. And lead us not into temptation to break your monopolies and empower other entrepreneurs. But deliver us from the evil ones who challenge your government. For thine is the sugar, the flour and the cement and rice and spaghetti forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so you like really cemented every part of like the old Nigerians and the new Nigerians. So according to this background and introduction, who are old Nigerians and who are we now? One of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the origins mm. of what is probably called, what we call Nigeria's dysfunction today is mm. because there is a certain connection between uh, the legacy of colonialism uh, and what we have today. And so one of the things I was trying to do was to, was to say that it is an important marker in trying to understand our history. Certainly much of my work also goes back beyond, uh, before colonialism, colonialism. To, to talk about what happened in the relationship between the, the various ethnic nationalities that existed in this space that we now call Nigeria. What was the relationship and, and what are the things that we have now that we can trace to that time? But also, what are the things you know, uh, uh, that have largely uh, changed? You know? in, for example, our, our, our contact with the mm. British and, and how has this abuse of power and the way in which people were organized for the purpose of exploitation, how has this affected governance as we, as we have it now? Also, what is the legacy of, of military rule and, and how has it spread dysfunction across the country so that we are in the state that we are in now? And that's sort of the background to, yeah. to, to, to this piece. Yeah, what were your findings about the connection and, the, you know, uh, the reality of Nigeria before the, colonial, before the colonial system? It is often... Does it e look the yeah. same it as we are yeah. seeing some things going now or is yeah. it relatively it is, different? It, yeah, it is often easy to uh, blame all the problems on colonialism. Certainly a lot of problems is connected to, to British uh, uh, invasion. However, we had hegemons that um, exerted power and abused authority before the British came. And one of the things that the British found was that these people who were already abusing power were good for them. And that's why in the piece I saw, you know, the British came, there were certain institutions they thought, oh, wow, this is great, you know, especially like feudal institutions, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and they thought this works great for them because they needed a system that was able to subjugate large amounts of people, you know, for, for an indefinite period of time. And so they allowed for the perpetration of, of, of those kind of abusive systems. And so, of course, we had the system of mistrust between ethnic nationalities mm -hmm. that the British was, were not interested in, 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 in quelling because it's not in their interest to have a united people who were uh, opposed to an invasion by, by, by a foreign force. And so, of course, I would say that um, many problems predate the, the colonial 
colonial, colonial invasion, mm -hmm. but the colonial invasion exacerbated the problems that they already uh, uh, found on the ground. But do you think that like uh, now we are counting more than 60 years mm. for having independence? Is it like people fail to understand it intentionally or mm. is just like this is the, the way things are going? I think one way to answer that question is to look at how averse Nigerians are to studying history. And you, you will you, uh, agree with me that in, in, in many Nigerian schools, history is not even on the, on the curriculum. You know, and even where history is on the curriculum for, for people in school, it is a very watered down version of our history. So I always say that the beginning, the, the, to, to, to understand Nigeria's problems, you must understand Nigeria's history. If you do not read history, then, then you will be groping in the dark, as, 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 it, as, it, as it were, and trying to find the, the solution to a problem you do not understand. Yeah, but why the problem keeps on going, since mm. we have famous historians from Nigerians and they are well known in the world, and mm. the problem keeps on you know, rising from mm. much generations? Because it's not in the interest of the Nigerian elite for history to be taught. So, for example, many of the people who com committed at atrocities in the Nigerian civil war are still alive. They're still in government, they're still in power. People who were beneficiaries of a long history of slavery, for example, in northern Nigeria, they're still alive. They're still connected to uh, uh, ruling, ruling houses. And, and so, of course, none of these people want their history interrogated. Nobody wants to be called a war criminal. Nobody wants to be said to be called the person who massacred people or who people who benefited from enslaving the sort of fellow citizens, you know. It's easier to just brush it under the carpet and pretend that everything is fine and that we are a nation that should function because we have oil wealth, you know, without talking about, you know, the underbelly and, and, and the, the, the fault lines, you know, that to the ordinary eye is not visible but which brews under the surface and, and, and causes all of these, these shifts that lead to the cracks that we see. Uh, I think this brings us to one important aspect about this book, how to become a Nigerian, a lead, a guide, I can say. Like you talk about uh, freedom of speech. Mm. How do you think or how do you see the connection of this freedom of of speech in the society? Yes, I mean, for any functional democracy, there must be the ability of citizens in that democracy to express their views either through the ballot or through um, conversations, whether dissatisfaction or, or satisfaction, beyond the ballot. and. You cannot say that you have a democracy where people express themselves and consequences follow very quickly, especially from, from government or from the police or from, from you know, politicians who are upset that people have expressed their opinion. And, and the democracies are strengthened by a robust debate between groups, political groups, uh, uh, political actors, uh, or just people who are affected by the decisions of, of, of politicians. And, one of the things that we have seen increasingly is that in Nigeria, I mean, we used to say in Nigeria that, oh, you can say anything and government won't do anything. Mm -hmm. But now we have governors that jail people for Facebook posts, you know, that threaten people because they t tweeted about things, that mm -hmm. harass people using the police because they wrote certain things in newspaper columns. Yeah. And so increasingly people worry about um, expressing themselves um, as frankly as they, they will because it is a right of citizens to interrogate the people that they put in power. Yeah, police are always being mentioned whenever there are a lot of situations yes. concerning harassment and, you know, uh, quelling freedom of speech. How can you or maybe read from the book how to become a police or... In yes, I, I would. I would like to do yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> I remember this. This. Uh, this. This particular chapter. Yeah. I, when when it was first published, it was published in in a in a because I had a column in a, in the in the newspaper, and a, a lot of policemen were very upset. You know, as particularly the the then spokesman of the of the Nigerian police, 
and he 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 threatened me and you know because he was he was really irritated that I that I wrote this and it it went viral and people kept reposting and reposting mm -hmm. and of course he accused me of 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 maligning the Nigerian police so that I I I, I have fond memories of yeah. this of this piece so I, I will read uh, part of it uh, it's called how to be a police officer You didn't know it would be like this when you were applying. You just knew you wanted a job. Your relatives came together and contributed the money you put in an envelope to grease the wheels that would roll you through the various recruitment levels. Money that was probably going to be bigger than your first salary. But no amount of money is too big for the privilege of wearing that uniform. You were excited about it, about the uniform, about the rank, the serial number, the name on your breast, but no one told you, no one whispered it into your ear that you would be serving an ungrateful, hateful bunch of people who think you are the worst thing since discovering palm oil on your white shirt as you walked into school on a Monday morning. You do not understand the hate. You cannot make sense of the lies they tell about you. But you will do your duty and serve your fatherland, or is it motherland, you can never tell, in spite of all the naysayers and bad belle people. You will be a police officer the checkpoint. God forbid that they put you on checkpoint duty, but somebody has to do it. Somebody has to flag down cars and shine a weak torch into people's faces. Somebody has to salute the people in nice cars and remind them that their boys are loyal. And especially on the weekend, somebody has to wish the law-abiding citizens happy weekend. Who else will give the road users the privilege of showing their appreciation for the selfless work that you do with a bit of cash? You are not doing anything wrong. Think if there were no beggars in Nigeria, if they all went on strike. All those people who go to Marabus and Juju priests would have nowhere to give the offering, offerings that form, part of the, that, that form part of the rituals. You perform a serious duty, so take it seriously. Raise your boys when you ask, anything for the boys? Or, Oga how you go be now? Or, Madame di Madame. Be proud of who you are. Be confident. Look people in the eye. Don't squeeze the notes that you receive. Fold them nicely. Put it in your front pocket. Slap it gently to make it sit comfortably. Because God sees your heart. The pot belly. You may start out thin and flat bellied. Do not see that as a thing of pride. You will look awkward with your police uniform tucked into your thin waist, with your stomach looking like a chalkboard. People will not respect you if you look hungry. Whether you are male or female, this applies to you. You need to slowly work your way to making your uniform look good and to make the journey around your large belly. That way, you look like authority when you tuck in your uniform. You look menacing enough to stop crime. The patrol vehicle. Like I said, you are a literary person. You are deep. So your patrol vehicle is an example of a symbol and a metaphor all in one. Don't mind the people who watch Hollywood movies and want to bring fiction into reality, wanting police patrol vehicles to look nice and neat, complete with bumpers and fenders, rear lights, windshields, a radio that works. Your patrol vehicle is a metaphor for the struggle of society. The dents are a metaphor for the impressions you want to make on people. The broken indicator is a metaphor for all the broken things which indicate how problematic crime can be, broken things which you intend to fix. Your job is to fight, fight crime, not to have a nice car. Leave the nice cars for politicians. Nobody has time for that. Don't bother replacing lights. Hold together your broken or cracked bumpers with nice thick copper wire. You are like that copper wire, holding the fabric of society together. And for this, God will bless you. Uh, the, 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 the discipline. People don't understand you. To get well-shaped metal tools, the blacksmith must beat it into shape. The blacksmith doesn't beat the red-hot iron because he hates it. Far from it. The blacksmith uh, smith beats it out of love for the craft of making metal, for making tools and items. Same with gold. It has to go through fire for purity. So when you hit a suspect or chain them, 
or beat, beat them until you get a confession or slam batons onto the soles of their feet or strip them naked or whip them. You do it out of love. The same way a mother would let a nurse inject a needle into the buttocks of her child. You want them to change. You want them to confess and write that statement that will make the ca case end quickly. God who see your, sees your heart knows this and will reward you greatly. I'll wow. stop there. Well, this, I think this chapter is almost like an umbrella because it says all. Yeah. Uh, as, as a writer, as a renowned star in Nigeria, how can you like contribute with your pen to like advocate for right of or freedom of speech in such country called Nigeria? Mm. I think that one of the ways of pushing the boundaries or, or testing democracy is asking what, how much can you say within the bounds of law and of human decency, you know, without getting extrajudicial punishment. And when we stop speaking, then we strengthen the people who seek to undermine democracy by silencing others. But when we continue speaking, when we, when we support other people who speak, whether or not we like what they say, then we strengthen, strengthen democracy. And, and I think one of the things I, I, I like to say is that freedom of speech is, is, is not useful if everybody says things that you like. Freedom of speech is especially useful for people you do not like. Because that is how you can test if you are truly dedicated to the idea of free speech, that people can say things that irritate you, that annoy you, that bring into question um, your politics, and, and that you are able to engage in, in conversation, you know, or change if you're a politician. And I think the same goes for, for the satirist, because like I said, the, the, the more I think, uh, conscientious satirists ask themselves how they are implicated. And so often the question is, how much am I willing to uh, listen to political opinions that I do not like, within the bounds, of course, of human decency and, 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 and what is right? And so it may, I, you know, I do not have to like it. So if people criticize my satire, for example, mm -hmm. or think that you know, I, my writing is bad, I always ask myself, am I the Nigerian politician? Am I, do I seek to silence the people who do not like my work? And, and I think that that's one of the ways that we can show, even as writers, that we are committed to the idea of free speech and, 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 and all of that. Mm -hmm. But also supporting people whose political opinions, the right of people whose political opinions we do not share to express those opinions. So for example, there are people whose political views I do not subscribe to, but yeah, but, that, but yeah. that's the point. I think mm -hmm. like there is a misunderstanding between you writers and some of the politicians because you tend to blind your eyes for their good works, mm -hmm. but sometimes you <laughs> only narrow how to criticize them. So mm -hmm. b before we come to this, um, don't forget you are following this program live and you have chance to put on your questions that you like to ask with the Yinka, and uh, she is in a parallel Zoom. You can talk to her live, and she will respond to you. So, Elnatan, this is, I think, a an, a big issue. A lot of people like you, maybe uh, in Nigeria, may like to, you know, uh, voice their opinion. Mm -hmm via such mediums, but the treat is there. Mm -hmm. How still, I will go back to the first question, how can, you know, this treat be erased away? Well, I think that we must understand that, especially with, with power and in a place where democracy is constantly undermined by um, people who claim to be democratic leaders, but who in fact are autocrats. I mean, we must continue to demand this 
this change. We, we cannot, we don't ask for it. And, and we keep pushing and we keep expressing ourselves even in the face of this, these threats. And we support the people who express themselves and who, are, who suffer because of the, the, these kinds of expression. And we bring to light uh, such kinds of persecution or oppression or, or, or clamping down on, on free speech, whether, whether it comes from the North or the South, or whether it comes from people in our ethnic group or not, whether it comes from people with our political, uh, uh, from our political leanings or not, we, we, we defend the right of people to express it, not, not merely agreeing with it, like, you know, uh, like the, the popular saying, um, you know, I, I may not agree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say. Yeah, you know, but how, how can yeah. they be agreed and agree like th their life are going to be safeguard because, you know, a lot of people um, have gone forever and a lot of people up till now, they were nowhere to be found, yes. you know? Yes, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worrying situation, you know. Yeah. There are people like uh, government critic Dadiata, for example, mm -hmm. who who has been missing for over yeah. a year now? He he was he was essentially disappeared. He, you know, g armed men came to his house and and took him away, and and we've never heard from him. So I think that one of the things that we do as writers is to say we will keep talking about it. So for example, one of the things I did in my column is with the Shia massacre, for example, that happened um, in in July 2014 and in December 2015. Um, at least the last two major ones, the first one, 33 people died, the second one, at least 370 people were buried in mass graves. We keep talking about it, and I remember I had, I had a permanent fixture in my column that, that drew attention because, the, because of how common tragedies are in Nigeria. It's very, very easy to forget that something has happened. And so if, if five people die today, you know that tomorrow 10 people will die. So mm -hmm. it's very easy to forget the five that happened yesterday. So, so sometimes we, we keep issues burning. We say, we refuse to forget that you rounded up hundreds of people who were unarmed and you shot them and you buried them in mass graves. We keep talking about it. We don't forget. We say, yes, it may have passed, but we keep talking about it. The same would say, for example, the people who were shot in Lekki recently during the massacre. Mm -hmm. that no, no matter how they tried to, re, to, 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 uh, to rewrite the narrative, we stay on 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 the, on, on the story. We stay on the, on the narrative, and we say this is what happened. We refuse any attempt to obscure, obf obfuscate the the narrative, or or, or or rewrite the facts if if that is even possible. Um, it's not easy because, of course, people might ask. You know, I'm in Nigeria. What you know? I don't, I don't want to be arrested, and that's the big problem with having a dictatorship in in power. But of course, under the the, the guise of, of, of democracy. And it's, it's, a, it's a fight that we must keep doing, whether we're in Nigeria, we're out of Nigeria. Uh, it will never stop. Power will not just give up. It will not, you know, power does not concede anything without a demand. And sometimes that demand has to be forceful. And sometimes, you know, that forceful demand has to be sustained for long periods of time, uh, much to our discomfort, but we must keep doing it. Uh, then you talked about how people presume the police work, but then after, upon they are in, their life and their attitude change. Is it like the, 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 the system or the people tend to change by their, by their self? Well, when a, a system is as rotten mm -hmm. and as um, unstable as, as the one we have, it is very difficult for anyone who means well to get going and, 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 and change the system. And the reason is the path to becoming a part of the system itself muddies a person so much that it leaves a trail of, of dirt even when a person is trying to clean up. That itself is a problem. So, of course, when you have to bribe your way into power, when you have to make enormous personal sacrifices that are many times unconscionable, um, that can constitute a barrier to, to, actually, um, to actualizing anything that, is, that, that, that challenges status quo. And, and so I think what must change is that the, the, the structure of what we have as a nation has to, is what we must question and challenge. And, mm. and, 
and keep fighting to, you know, to, to be changed. Because with, with, with the current structure, we, it will not matter who goes in, you know, because everything, the, the system itself is sustained by dysfunction. So I always say Nigeria is not so much inefficient, but, it, but an efficient dysfunction. So it's not that, you know, it's, it's quite, so it's, it's, it, it, it is by design, it's not by mistake, it's not that a few, a few people are not working well, so Nigeria doesn't work. It is actually a well-designed dysfunction that is meant to be efficient in its dysfunction. So it is the people, not the system. Well, both. I mean, you know, one affects the other. So culture, for example, is created through many means. It's created by practice. Mm -hmm. It's also created by power sometimes. Power can, over the exertion of power, uh, over a long period of time can make people react in ways that can constitute culture, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you do a thing over and over and over again, it, you know, it becomes a practice and that practice can become culture. And so uh, that's one of the problems. So people begin to act in ways that allow them to survive within the system or to manipulate the system for their own ends. And so that, that forms a certain kind of culture when it happens over a long period of time. Children are born, and all they know is that, well, if you're going to go to get a driver's license, to get it quickly, you must pay someone money. It becomes a given. So you, you no longer question it. It becomes part of the fabric of, of life that I know to give someone money, or I know that if, I'm, if I have contact with the Nigerian police, I may be shot dead. I know that if I'm shot dead by the Nigerian police, it is unlikely that I will ever get, get justice. And I know that I need to know somebody for anything significantly good to happen to me. So, so people begin to think like that, and mm -hmm. they begin to act in those kind of ways. They organize based on interest, and they try to sort of work the system. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it now becomes both, you know, yeah. on both ends. Yeah. Both the people are affected, mm -hmm. and the culture is affected. Mm -hmm. In some situations, people tend to, like, you know, save the money for for their bail or to give somebody before yeah. before doing you know the bad work, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, of course, because they know that this is this is what yeah. happens, and that's how the countries run. And so you know that when you're going in, even for people doing business, for example, you have if you see people advising uh, 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 companies, they ask as the cost of doing business to include bribes paid to Nigerian politicians. Otherwise, you cannot do business in Nigeria, you know. Or, for example, that you, 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 you ask yourself, well, I'm going to be kidnapped if I go to a certain place. People are starting to keep, keep ransom money at home. People are starting to have ransom money just in case because they live in areas where kidnapping is so rife and, and that they know that it's, it's, not, a, it's not if but when. And, and that kind of dysfunction, that kind of, you know, people live with this kind of trauma and it becomes mm -hmm. part of everyday life. And of course, it affects the way people react, behave, you know, relative to, to their neighbors. You know, it, it affects how people interact. It affects their temperament. It affects how they see life. It affects the things that they are willing to do and the lengths they are willing to go to get what they want to get. And that, that, um, it, that's why that the, the, the cycle must be broken. Where the gap is, is the people in power doesn't know what is going on, or is the problem just keep on going from the grassroots? Well, like I said, it is it is it is not a flaw, mm -hmm. but a design. It is not that th this problem. Yeah, because if you if you critically study the situation in some. Uh, circumstance, if you happens to be, you know, in a high-ranking position, you already started from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you already know the problem. Mm -hmm. And once you are now in the top high-ranking position, it's very difficult for you to say you don't know what is going on the ground. And yeah. why is it so difficult to, to make change effectively? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, it's a, it's a vicious it's a vicious uh, um, um, cycle uh, because to get in you need to do unconscionable things. To stay in you mm -hmm. need to do unconscionable things, and you can't just walk out because you've done so many things mm -hmm. with so many people, and so you are a risk to them. Um, and so you keep doing unconscionable things to remain safe. Uh, so, like I said, we need and there are lots of people 
so it's not like everyone everyone is just horrible mm. there are lots of people who are interested in change who have perhaps the capacity for change and they just need they need to find each other they need to build um, um, coalitions networks uh, a, a broad range of of connections across ethnic nationalities across age groups across uh, um, um, genders to be able to say well how are we able to break the stranglehold on on the polity that 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 these people have and it's a very long process you know and it's a process that you find nigerians engaged in everywhere around the world you find nigerians in groups thinking how do we make nigeria better how do we stop this from completely crumbling crumbling the country so people are sort of talking people are trying people are doing the work i think what needs to happen is that we need to have that the groundswell that that critical mass that will that will shift things that will put a dent in 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 the in the, in the stranglehold that they have nigerians in diaspora are doing enough to to make these things happen well i think that the real change will come from nigerians that live in nigeria and i and i know that nigerians in that diaspora um a lot of the things that they do, so for example, in the NSARS protests, mm -hmm. much of the money that sustained that protest throughout came from outside, outside Nigeria. Yeah, it's true. You know, and they were able to raise almost a million, almost a million dollars. You yeah, know, but but this, uh, do you think those that are in Nigeria, they are like the majority, Certainly. if you compare to those who live abroad, mm -hmm. but. The problem is, do you think those are back home able to feel and understand the real situation as Nigerians abroad think back home? Well, so one of the things is, if you are a Nigerian abroad, unless all of your family is, is, is abroad with you, you know what's happening in Nigeria. You feel it. If your if your mother is kidnapped, you you know you know if your if your uncle is 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 traveling and he has an accident and he breaks his leg, you will you will feel it. If you if your brother is at home and he gets burgled or kidnapped, you feel it. So and 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 the other way around, Nigerians go back home a lot. You know, right. Nigerians go back and forth. So people yeah, but have. I mean, yeah. I mean, Nathan, like for example, um, Nigerians who are living abroad, like show concern mm -hmm. about the corruption, mm -hmm. the instability of mm -hmm. government, and a lot of, you know, unconditional things. Mm -hmm. But it's like those back home didn't mm -hmm. feel it the way Nigerians abroad feel it. Do, do you have that sense also? It's like since they are the majority, mm -hmm. if they can feel and see the, the dangers you know, the way people see it from outside, like things will change. Well, I'm, yeah, well, I'm, I'm certain that no one feels the pinch more than the person wearing the shoe. And what the problem is that Nigerians, from the long history of th things that have failed, know that in at least in the short run, it may be a better use of their energy to try to work the system as opposed to fight the system. When you, when you see that people are jailed or people are killed when they rebel against government, then you start to ask, well, well how can I find my way around the system? And so that's, that's one of the problems, that Nigerians have learned how to cope as opposed to learning how to fight the system, you know? And so they, they, they feel it, of course they feel it, but they, so they, they know... have no any option than, yeah, when, than to follow the process. When, when, when you know that the the only person that can help you stands at the gate and he says, give me X, you turn around and there's nobody w helping you, you may begin to say, well, maybe I should just give him this and, and move, you know? It's the reason why, for example, traffic in certain places is bad because you know, if I stay on the queue, three people are going to come and, and shunt the queue. And if I don't do the same shunting, I will be there until midnight. And so people will, will stand and say, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me follow the queue, let me follow the queue. One person will come and pass, mm -hmm. two people, three people. And then they'll be like, well, I'm not going to stay here all night. And then they will pass. So the when they do it the first time, the next time it becomes easier. So it's just like, like, like the saying, uh, if you can't beat them, 
yeah. join them. Yeah. So that I, I think it's a... But also, I, I try not to be too hard on Nigerians who... And I don't want to use the word compromise, but mm. who find ways to survive. Because it is survival. Because this is a space where you are one event, no matter how much wealth you have, mm. you are one event from a tragedy. You are one uh, uh, trailer falling on your car away from death. You are one kidnap away from emptying all of your savings, you know? You are one health problem away from selling that nice car that you have to send your, your wife or your husband to India for an, oper op an operation. And so, of course, it, when, when people have to s face that reality day in, day out, I'm, re I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to blame them for remaining in that situation. And that's why I said it, it takes the effort of very many people to be able to break that 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 stranglehold that the elite has on on the people because then w when that happens people will people will rise and say well you know we've had enough but until people know that there is a viable option they will keep trying to survive you know that they're not going to just give up and die they will keep trying to survive so now what options you know remains for a lot of Nigerians who really needs to be in the position to make the changes effectively. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I'm encouraged by is the amount of the number of Nigerians I see having these conversations mm -hmm. offline, online, who are meeting, especially um, younger Nigerians who are asking the question, how can I contribute to a Nigeria that is functional? How can I break the cycle? How can I be part of a new Nigeria? And, and those conversations will lead somewhere eventually because there are a lot of people having them. Mm, of course, one of the things that needs to happen is that people need to understand the, the various ways in which they can participate in the democratic project beyond simply going to vote. That people understand that being a citizen in a democratic country means that you take the role of the citizen very seriously, that you know, you know how implicated you can be in the dysfunction and so you refuse to participate for example in the everyday corruption in the um, whitewashing of corrupt dictators and and murderous dictators in you refuse to participate for example in the um, rewriting of history where you know politicians leave power and suddenly they you know they, they launder their image and come back into into society and start complaining about the country again which we see over and over again People from the last corrupt regime will come and start complaining about the next corrupt regime. So if, you know, Nigerians need to, to begin taking more seriously um, um, how they operate socially and say, well, if we refuse to allow people who are part of this dysfunction to have social currency, maybe we begin to discourage this from becoming culture, you know, that kind of thing. So thank you so much, Elnat and John. A lot of uh, the discussion will be going on mm -hmm. later. So this is the first reading of how oh, Becoming Nigeria, a guide from Elnat and John. This book was published by Cassava Republic Press in 2019. And uh, his novel called Born on Tuesday treats the lack of perspective of young men and the growing Islamification in northern Nigeria, respectively. This book won the Betty Trucks Award and was shortlisted for the Nigerian Prize for Literature. It has been translated into German and French as well and won the 2019 Le Prix Literature Less Afrique. So keep your question coming, and Yinka is with you live. We will present those questions later after this short break. Thank you.
So welcome back. This is the first reading of uh, Becoming Nigeria, a guide with Elnathan John. And um, as we said earlier at the beginning, uh, Yinka is live in a separate Zoom. So she will be discussing some unpublic questions and discussion with you. And now we have some questions from uh, uh, students and uh, those who are following us live on the stream. So thanks, Rebecca, for these questions. And uh, Elnathan will have some readings later. Uh, but now, Elnathan, we have some questions from uh, one particularly is from a school near Bonn, uh, but Honef. Uh, the question says, what will you want to change in people's mind about Nigeria? For example, regarding prejudice or stereotype that many have. These questions uh, come from a school in Bad Honef where you have to be there live, but due to the pandemic, we couldn't make it. So mm -hmm. uh, this is one question from the school. That's a, it's a very good question. What, one way of answering this question um, is that as opposed to making people think differently about Nigeria, I would like Nigeria to exist in a space that prompts people to think differently about it. And what I mean is, a lot of the stereotypes that happen or that exist about Nigeria are driven in part, not just by ignorance, but, but, by, the situa but by the condition of Nigeria. And so that it is a much easier, I think, enterprise to change the hearts and minds of Nigerians when Nigeria is functional. The more functional Nigeria becomes, the easier it is for people to see things that Nigeria is doing. So for example, when I, when I, when I think of India, for example, there's a lot I think of about India. I don't first think of, you know, I, I think, oh, you know, I think of Indian cinema because of the influence of Indian cinema, for example, on Nigerian Kennywood industry, for example. I think of I think of Aishwara Rai, I think of Shah Rukh Khan, I think of, these are the first images I had, of, you know, growing up. And so when, it, when, it, when industry is functioning, then it is easier to have parallel narratives. You will never be able to remove all stereotypes about Nigeria. But what you can do is that you can infuse the, the marketplace of ideas with more to think about and say, Nigeria is doing X, Nigeria is doing Y. But the fact is that there is there is a there are a lot of people right now leaving Nigeria, not for not for great reasons, and that drowns out all of the great things about Nigeria, you know whether it is our food, whether it is the fact that there are quite a lot of Nigerians doing great things all around the world, whether it's our literature, you know, whether it's a lot of our culture, whether it is um, the the sort of can-do spirit of Nigerian. I would like that more people are interested in, for example, Nigerian languages. Um, Hausa, for example, is the second most widely spoken uh, language uh, on the continent of Africa, right after Swahili. I would like more people to learn, to learn Hausa. I would like more people to read the poetry of Nana Asma'u, for example, who was the daughter of uh, Usman Nongfodio, who wrote lots of poetry, for example. I would like people to know that we had literacy and writing and scholarship long before the British came to Nigeria. That you can read the letters between, for example, the Sokoto Caliphate and the, the Kanemborno Empire shortly after uh, 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 the, the Jihad happened, where there was an intellectual debate about whether or not the Sokoto Caliphate had the right to invade another sort of Muslim empire like Kanemborno. You know, I would like people to, to, to look at the body of work from um, Nigerian artists, for example. And, and there are all of these things. But I, like I said, the more functional Nigeria is, the easier it is for you to see these other things. 
the more the, the you know the more we have news like every single day herdsmen dying every single day farmers dying every single day villagers being killed or police shooting people it drowns out all of this good news it drowns out all of the possibilities of learning about a vast and varied people who whose languages are rich whose food is rich whose culture is rich you know Why are the good things not been hard like the bad well, like I said, I, will, I, I also am not in the business of whitewashing Nigeria. I'm not interested in doing this at all. The reason is that because I'm involved in the kind of work that exposes me to the real problems of Nigeria, I think that it would be a disservice to the country itself to attempt to pretend that there, there aren't enormous, enormous problems, that Nigeria itself is not a deeply, deeply dysfunctional country. But like I said, Nigeria is also a, a very, very interesting country, a, a country who's who, rich in culture and, and diversity and, and language and literature and music, you know, and cinema and, 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 and all of this. So, so, but so, when, when mm. people like you mm -hmm. are going to begin to, you know, focus mm -hmm. on all these things that you have just mentioned? Well, I, well, I already do. I, like I said, much of the research I've been doing in the past three years has been about Nigerian history. Mm. And I'm, I'm writing, for example, about Nigerian history that's not popular. Like, for example, I'm writing the history of, um, of a town in northeast Nigeria called Ningi, mm. which was a, a, a town that existed in semi-independence uh, from the Sokoto Caliphate from about the early 1850s until the British came and, and, and conquered in, 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 in the 1900s. You know, small towns like that that existed and was, was essentially a thorn in the side of the Sokoto Caliphate for, for over 50 years. So I'm interested in that kind of history. I'm interested in the history of the wife of the founder of that town, uh, you know, in its, in its incarnation as a Hausa town, you know. Who was she? I'm interested in, in Bori culture, for example. And I write about that a lot. I'm interested in in uh, the relationship between things like Bori culture and Islam in Nigeria, you know, that, you know, and, and, and people who follow my work um, um, have, have seen me write about this. So, so this, this exists, um, and I keep doing my bit to expand the realm of possibilities when it comes to thinking about Nigeria. What, you know, what are the interesting things that, you know, you do not know, for example, about Nigeria? And I do that kind of work, work a lot. And yeah, This brings yeah. us to the second question um, yeah. from uh, which says, what do you think is the biggest problem in Nigeria which we may not know about or the media doesn't talk about? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's a competition for that, and there are so many, and I cannot, I cannot point to one that's the biggest. I will, I will mention a few things that I think um, go uh, um, unnoticed, or at least are sh swept under the carpet. One, one of them is, like I mentioned earlier, the, the Shiite crisis, and the hundreds, if not thousands, of Shiites who have either been killed or been made to disappear in, in northern Nigeria. Um, the Shiites have suffered from the general agreement of, I think, all the parties involved that they hate Iran. And so, unfortunately, as a group that is allied in some way to, to that country, when they are massacred, everyone turns a blind eye because it's like, mm, well, it's those guys who are this connected to Iran. Like an international reaction, can we categorize it like an yeah. neglected or it is neglected it, it, the reason it, is that people still get keep getting killed because there are protests every few months in abuja and there's always one person shot two people shot nobody carries this news anymore you know when it was 300 people yes it was in the news but no one talks about the people that keep getting killed every other month on the streets of abuja during the protests that are usually held to to protest that particular ma massacre so it, it doesn't get to the news you know the 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 farmer uh, the farmers and villagers who keep getting killed in places like Zampara and Katsina, for example, you know, for many reasons, whether it's banditry or it's it's illegal mining of of, of minerals and gold that you know 
causes bandits to sort of wipe out certain villages in the north. The, the general insecurity, you know, and I think that that's a that's a big it's a it's a big big problem. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm because I study northern Nigeria, I'm particularly interested in 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 those few things. Uh, like I said, there's a whole there's a myriad list of of cases that we can talk about, but but I, I I'm worried about the 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 Shia crisis and especially the uh the the banditry and insecurity that happens in northern Nigeria because of its very many porous borders and the ease with which bandits can can come in and out and it's a whole other com conversation that we can have another day here is another question comes in which says can you tell us more about your own personal trajectory what was your motivation to study law and how did mm. you then get into writing I like that question. Um, I, it's funny, I never knew anyone who was a lawyer before I decided to do it. I didn't have lawyers in my family. Most of my people in my family didn't go to university or anything like that. Um, my mother didn't, my father didn't. Um, and I didn't know lawyers. So for me, I, was, I remember holding the Joint Admissions Matriculations Board, uh, uh, the, the JAM, what we call JAM brochure. And I was searching for courses that I could study. And I was looking at what I had in the O-levels. And my father was saying, you know, you need to study something practical, like economics or banking or computers. Because he was, my, my father was very interested in computers. And he said, look, this is a thing that would be very good. Go on, become. And I did, I did start studying computer science. Um, but I was a bit restless. And I, and I didn't want to do it, my father wanted me to do so and that was you know I, I was a rebel like that you know my father said oh don't study law because you know look at all and in my neighborhood and in my state long time study yeah not just that but many lawyers were very poor and you know lawyers are it, until recently they've been one of the poorest paid professionals in Nigeria you it will come as a shock in the same way that many doctors don't get their salaries for months you find junior lawyers earning very very little and you know the f the joke of them being charge and bail lawyers that you know you would see a lawyer with like shoes that were terrible with a white shirt that had turned gray and my, you know they were like do you want to become like that really so so i i rebelled against this by saying you know what i'll study this law i'll just do it so but then go, i came to love it for the respect that owes them no no i i i i, I did it out of rebellion mm -hmm. but then i came to love it because of what studying law exposed me to the amount of critical thinking that it forced me to do the amount of history that i was forced to read coincidentally the the person that taught me history in when i was studying law was was sort of a marxist scholar and he was very interested in the history of africa and and in replacing sort of colonial narratives of history with with accurate narratives of history so we were forced to read all of the marxist material all of the uh, um, the history that was intent on removing all of the uh, sort of stereotypes that existed in, in, within the space of Nigerian history, all of the legends of origin, that kind of thing. And so we studied everything from, from, from Abdullah Smith to YB Usman, you know, while studying Karl Marx, you know, and Mao Zedong, that kind of thing. So, so I, I, I left that and I was disillusioned by the speed or rather the lack of speed of, of, of law and how, how much hierarchy there was in law and how much you had to say, sir, sir, yes, sir, mm. yes, my lord. You had to bow down to people and that things were really, really slow, you know, and worse, the corruption within the system where as a junior lawyer, you couldn't say, if your boss said, go give the registrar 5,000. You can't say no I'm not going to I'm not going to bribe the registrar. It's not your case. You are you are you are a junior in that place. You go give the registrar five thousand. Just to obey. You know. So I, I was I was a bit irritated by all of these kind of things, and I was a bit restless. And I I came to love uh, you know literature, and 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 I'm and I made the switch. Oh, here comes another question. Does your satire also cover Nigerian women and their role in Nigerian society? And if not, why? My satire interrogates as many expressions of power as I can sort of 
<laughs> dig my hands into in, in, within the Nigerian system because of my understanding that power itself you know is diffuse and exists in many places so yes sometimes I I do write about uh, expressions of power by by Nigerian women so for example I wrote about uh, the chapter called how to own a Nigerian slave which also uh, had a bit about the imp how certain groups of Nigerian women are implicated in in domestic abuse and in, in, in what I call the system of slavery in, in middle class Nigeria. So, so yes, I do that. But, but to specific, if, if it's specifically about um, uh, women, I, I, I will not say that I zoom in on that because um, that's a completely different uh, uh, subject. I, I try to look at the, the, the way that power is expressed within Nigeria. And, and if, we, if you understand how Nigerian society is, women are at the very bottom of those expressions of power because of, of, of patriarchy, you know, because of the way religion, for example, um, um, enforces patriarchy, because of the way politics um, utilizes patriarchy and that kind of thing. But to the extent that um, um, women are implicated in, like I said, this, these d diffuse expressions of power, I, I, I write about them. And uh, how do you see the impact of such making their life into consideration also? Well, um, with regard to impact, I, w I would say that, hmm, I mean, the, the, a lot remains to be seen about how, for example, one's writing affects um, daily life. We sometimes just put a, a drop in a, in a bucket and these drops hopefully amount to something, but um, I will not be presumptuous to say that my work causes any particular change, but that I hope that I add to a large narrative that exists and that is written by many people, not, not just me, but many Nigerian men, women, um, who undertake this uh, very important task of um, um, writing Nigeria's history and, and creating the narratives that, that form the body of work that is Nigerian literature. And uh, the last question is, how do you see the political protest, especially coming from young generation against SARS compared to the protests in the past of Fela Kuti mm -hmm. or Kansar Wiwa in the past? That's a very important question. I think for many people, the protests that happened in Lagos following the, or rather that coincided with the, the, the massacre at, at the Leki toll gate, marked the, a change or, uh, from what might be considered a, a sort of lackadaisical attitude to politics by Nigerian youth. Um, but uh, I think remarkably, it was the first time that Nigerians of that kind of class you know, what may be some kind of pseudo middle class um, were fully engaged on the streets, especially upwardly mobile Nigerians, young Nigerians, you know, showed the power, their power of organization and that they utilized their access to, to the digital space and to their international connections to be able to uh, sustain that protest for the, for the, for the period of time that it, it was sustained. And so it was um, very importantly not a protest led by known activists, you know, or, or the usual uh, players, but, but so-called faceless uh, uh, people who organized behind the scenes, behind the curtains, at much risk to themselves, to their lives and to their families. Um, notably, for example, the Feminist Coalition, um, a, a group of, of, of young women who you know, went way, way above, head and above, you know, to, to make sure that this protest uh, happened. And, you know, they, a lot of them suffered for it. Um, so that, th th in that way, it was different, that there was a, a larger spread and a, dem a demographic that was not usually uh, interested in the, these kinds of, 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 of issues. Uh, and so it wasn't like poor people suffering that went to the streets. It was largely middle-class people who were concerned about the brutality of, 
of the police and said, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. And, and they went to the street. So, so I think that it, for me, it's very important that the, these uh, um, amazing young men and women, you know, left the comfort of their homes and, and, and went out to the streets and faced the guns of the Nigerian um, um, uh, autocrats who are, who are in power. And, and that, in that way, it's different. I think that what needs to be done is a consolidation of all of the efforts that led to that, um, that culminated in that action. And, uh, you know, seeing how this can be used for larger, lo more long-term efforts to break the stranglehold of, of, uh, of, of power that, that the Nigerian elite has. Yeah. And Latin, you have gone to so many countries and... Um there is also a specific chapter in this book, uh, Be a Nigeria, a guide on the, how to, to be a good Africa. And you talked about from the perspective of even not only for you being to go to so many countries, mm. you can able to be a good African, for example. And uh, by reading, watching, and uh, having like connection with foreigners is also like an opportunity for you to travel, but on a seat. Like you talked about um, not to risk life for going to so many countries. Can you give us a read from? The chapter, like an advice you, you wrote in this book on the travel advice. Yeah. All right. The, do you mean the travel advice to the US? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, this chapter is uh, titled Travel Advice for Nigerians Going to the US. So just the background, of course, it was, it was modeled after, well, actually, I shouldn't do this. My, 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 my motto is never, ever explain satire. Okay, I just read it. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Federal Republic of Nigeria warns Nigerian citizens of the continuing risks of travel to the U.S. and recommends that Nigerian citizens avoid all travel to Arkansas, California, Idaho, Mississippi, Missouri, Nevada, New Jersey, Texas, Tennessee, and Wisconsin because of the large amount of hate groups and or the situation in those states being fluid and unpredictable. Due to the persistent threat of domestic th terrorism by lone white wolves with mental health issues, the Nigerian government restricts travel by Nigerian government personnel to all areas where civilian Americans are allowed to freely purchase automatic firearms and limits the activities of the Nigerian government and their family members while in New York, Atlanta, and Houston. To be clear, they have guns and they kill people, especially black people. The federal government strongly urges Nigerian citizens in the US to consider their personal security and to keep their personal safety in the forefront of their travel planning. We know some of you who are very light-skinned or even mixed race may think you will be exempt from this hate against black people. This for many years of being fondly called Oyibo in Nigeria. You are sorely mistaken. In America, anyone who is not 100% white is black. You are black. They will kill you if they catch you. The ability of the federal government to provide assistance to Nigerian citizens in Alaska, Arkansas, Idaho, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Wyoming remains severely limited. The federal government continues to recommend against all but essential travel to the following states due to the risk of police shootings and brutality, drug gangs, racist attacks, white nationalists, unhealthy fast food linked to diabetes, measles, and anti-vaxxers, people who go on Jerry Springer, drive-by shootings, violence on Black Friday, Donald Trump, Donald Trump supporters, and other similarly dangerous things. Many, many more. <laughs> I have in this chapter and so many chapters that are very, very interested in this book. Becoming Nigeria, a guide from Ernatan John. Thank you so much for having us and for this been wonderful my, It's been book. my pleasure. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much for being with us live. And don't forget, you can donate as you wish for this program. So on behalf of the crew, 
and everyone who uh, give us time to be with us live from the beginning till now, we are saying goodbye next time we meet. Thank you.